welcome everybody to our sixth episode for 2021. We will be covering the topic of um, um, peak testing using our VLT systems. We have special guests. I will go into these into a moment. Thank you to the people who have returned to view these further webinars at the end of the year. Kevin, roll action, please. Three. Okay, again, next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody back to the rest of the season for 2021. Um, very quickly, for the people who maybe do not know, the goals of these webinars are that they are designed to be short, um, bite sized events, so they do not take up too much of our and too much of your time. Um, we also hope through that approach that it is an agile format so that we can chop and change and improve our game. Um, as we go through the series and through the year. Um, what you will hear is you will hear news and developments from Fagentech and maybe from our guest speakers as well, if I remember to invite them to speak. You will hear about the, the core of the webinar title itself, so products and technologies. At any point through the course of this webinar, we hope that the audience is prepared to join in with some questions and answers. Post your questions and answers to the chat, please. Um, and I will do my best to watch those and bring those in at the right points in time. And we will do our best to get you a real answer, Kevin. Uh, as always, we have a giveaway. Um, it's not entirely the questions that are going to be here that are, you can see here on this slide. We have a giveaway. We have a, uh, the Germans call it a Wundertüter, the English call it a lucky bag. It is a, a collection of, of items high tech and other items you may find useful to the people who can answer this question correctly. Answers please into the chat. So the first question is, when was VLC Photonics founded? VLC Photonics together with Inigo Atondo, CEO of VLC, is one of the guest speakers today. When was that company founded? They're based in Valencia. And the other question is, is when did Inigo Atondo join VLC himself? Answers into the chat, please, and let's see what comes out, out of that. Before we go any further, I am uh, there's a new slide here I'm going to present, but I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to invent our um, invent, um, introduce our guest speakers today. Um, we have um, Andrea, Professor Andrea Maloni from the Politecnico di Milano. Um, Andrea, hi, hello, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Greg, uh, for the presentation. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, we, um, we, we haven't started yet, Andrea, in a moment. Okay. And um, we have Inigo Atondo, CEO from VLC Photonics. Um, hi, Inigo. Hi, Greg. Hi, everyone. I guess I cannot participate on the freebies, right? <laughs> uh, well, that is very true. That's, um, you know the answers, of course. So we have a control for the answers that do come in. Yes. And moving on with this slide, um, and I've introduced the guys. No, Kevin, back one, please. Thank you. So moving on with this slide, um, I wanted to um, bring in Inigo for one point as well. The first point on this slide is that Ficantech is hiring. And before I pass you on to Torsten to maybe make a couple of comments about the type of people we're looking for, um, Inigo, I believe VLC Photonics is looking for people as well. Yeah, very quickly, we are also hiring. So we are always open to new candidates uh, that are experts on photonic circuit design or photonic uh, testing. So if anyone is interested, please have a look at our website. On the company section, you will have some, um, yeah, some, more, some offers. Okay. And Torsten, what, are you, what type of people are we looking for? So we, we are looking currently for uh, all type of different people. So uh, specifically in engineering, we need uh, to expand our, our automation team dramatically. Um, we're hiring in our facility in Estonia. We're hiring in our facility in China. We're hiring in our uh, facility in, in, um, in specifically in Germany and, and also in our um, new application lab in US. We are hiring uh, currently project management. Um, we are looking for new uh, mechanical and also electrical uh, designers. So 
specifically after now the COVID period, we are expanding um, very rapidly and we need, we need good people for that. And I think also at HQ in, in, in Aachen, we're looking for people across the board in all departments, right? Marketing, yep. sales, um, operations, the automation group, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. Okay, thank you. So if I can take recently to, took part in um, another item of news, we took part in the ECOC event in Bordeaux. That was actually quite an interesting event. It was obviously not as large as we were anticipating from previous years, but of course we have the COVID situation still. Um, but it was nonetheless remarkable because it was interesting to see how many people were there, how many people wanted to speak, how many people came to the booth. Um, so all in all, I believe it was still a very useful exercise for us. One other item of news is that the, the very next webinar in our series is this time next week on Wednesday. We will be having a look at the development of our fiber preparation concept. And we will be doing that together with Dr. Eric Becker, a close partner and associate from the front of the IOF. They have a number of systems from Fagentech and with senior product manager of Fagentech, Arne Bernfeld. So make sure you add that to your calendar um, and join us next week for that topic. If you want a short description on um, what that will cover, you will find that on our webinar page um, on the website. So let me just let a couple more people in here. Okay, thank you. Kevin, next slide, please. So I've done the introductions. Um, um, the first point I want to make here, we will be talking about PIC testing with our wafer level test systems. Um, an important point to make is that at least from five and six side, this material has to a large extent been presented before. So we will not be repeating it here. Instead, we will be giving the stage to first to Andrea and then to Inigo. And if you wanted to see what Feigentech has presented on this topic beforehand, then you will need to look at episode four back in April. Um, and if you follow that QR code on the left of the slide, um, you, will see, um, you will see the list of webinars from this year and you will see, be able to log in and see that video. Uh, alternatively, you can also freely watch the um, Lysian Tech Academy webinar that took place in June. Um, much of the same content again with some slight updates and again all we will be hearing from Torsten today apart from him and myself joining the conversation is maybe the developments that have happened since those two webinars otherwise as I said the stage goes to Andrea and Inigo so we will start the presentations with Professor Andrea Meloni from the Politecnico di Milano he will um, be presenting us with um, what the origins of his group what they do and of course, what the relationship is to Feigentech and, and the work he has been doing as part of the, as well, I will let him describe everything. He knows it better than I do. Andrea, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Gregor, for the, for the introduction. Uh, um, uh, we can jump to the next uh, slide. Uh, uh, I'm a, a professor in uh, electromagnetic field at Politecnico of Milano, working in the, the field of uh, uh photonics integrated photonics since uh, 25 years more or less and uh, so this long time uh, uh, gave us the opportunity to work on uh, most of the technologies glass on silicon silicon photonics uh, neophosphate lithium niobate etc on uh, uh, design on the analysis uh, on the circuit uh, level uh, electromagnetic level uh, statistical methods uh, up to the system we are not system people but we we can go up to, to 200 gigabit per second and especially now on the control of complex uh, photonic circuit that is uh, uh, quite relevant for the for the testing part in this slide you see another uh, logo uh, polyfab is uh, the clean room that we have uh, uh, in uh, in Politecnico uh, um, 600 square meter that is a really a great support for uh, testing and uh, assembly. There is another logo in this uh, slide uh, in the upper part T3 so if please uh, jump to the next uh, slide T3 is a joint research center uh, in Polytechnic of Milano. We have uh, some of this uh, is a agreement, a framework agreement between the Polytechnic and one or more companies uh, 
that do research in a given field. The framework permitted to protect the intellectual properties and the companies or the company that is in this case is Ficontech can exploit commercially the intellectual properties. The scope uh, is wafer level testing uh, on uh, so characterization testing, uh, optical, electrical, uh, and uh, not now, but in future also RF testing. Develop the instrumentation and the tool for testing and develop a technique and algorithm for uh, the, the testing as you will see in the next uh, in the next slide. Andrea, uh, can I quickly, so the, the, the JRC is an open collaboration format, I guess. It's, it's like a template that you can apply to different groups for, for encouraging interaction between industry and, and universities. Is that correct? Uh, is, uh, yes, we have a template uh, clearly, but uh, uh, to enter in uh, in the particular JRC, in this case a T-Cube, one has to, to apply and uh, uh, the partner, FICONTECH and Polytechnic in this case, uh, has to accept the, the next partner that should work on the same uh, field with the same uh, uh, idea and uh, yeah, and, so basically and, it's open to new partners. And Andrea and Thorsten, Thorsten, maybe you have a comment as well. Um, where did this initial, where did the initial initiative come from then? Whose side? You're muted, Torsten. Sorry, we were looking for a, a partner who is um, bringing us one step further in the um, in the instrumentation. So uh, we are well known in the um, in the building machines, uh, but not necessarily uh, um, in the test electronics around these uh, these components. And we were looking for a partner, and uh, Ignazio Piacentini. Um, who now uh, just retired, uh, brought us in, in contact uh, with um, Polytechnic Milan, uh, specifically Andrea, and uh, we um, uh, found this great tool uh, of the JRC in order to move forward. Okay, thank you. Please continue. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so let's jump to the next uh, slide. Uh, so this is a... a not 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 obvious uh, uh, slide and they're really uh, related to the activities of uh, behind the, the the JRC and the philosophy of the of the JRC. So uh, these are three questions: uh, Why do the testing? What test? And how do the testing? Uh, uh, three questions that are is not so obvious to to reply, and uh, uh, everyone every partner, every user, every group has his own uh, perception of uh, what does it mean, uh, why, what and how. And on the left you see uh, terms, uh, words uh, that are usually considered as a synonymous of testing. Characterization, verification, qualification, validation. Well, it's not, it's not so uh, uh, simple. There are big difference between this. So uh, try to understand what does it mean testing in photonics uh, is one of the main scope of uh, uh, the also between the main scope of the, the JRC. Uh, the, the longer list that you see here are possible activities. Obviously, not everyone is uh, is ongoing because of the resources, but uh, this is uh, our field. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I would like to start uh, uh, um, something more uh, specific and technical uh, and uh, use uh, this uh, big device. This is uh, one of our last baby. Um, it's a rather complex device. It's an optical drop multiplexer, polarization independent, that works on 128 channel in the C-band. Uh, huge device. It, so, if you look at this, uh, testing what? It's not so easy to, to answer. There are 16 complex filters, 64 ring resonators, uh, 32 mazenda, 32 modulator, etc., etc., etc. So, um, what can say? Uh, what can I do? What I should test? In the next slide, you see uh, uh, 
this is a part of the mask layout, a ring resonator that is a building block of these filters, and uh, well, is a waveguide, is a bent waveguide, there are directional capper, and this is just a, a, a ring resonator. Please click, and uh, you see that uh, this ring is a part of the filter. Four ring, two Mazender, straight waveguide, bent waveguide, uh, ether, PN junction. Please click. And you see that this is a part of uh, the uh, simple ad hoc multiplexer able to manage four channels. And if you click, you see that this is a part of a reticle where there are many uh, other circuits. And on the top left, you see the, uh, we call it Empire State Building, the, 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 big, uh, the big circuit and many parts. And this is uh, just a reticle. So if you click, uh, you see that on wafer, there are, uh, well, hundreds of not thousands of these uh, devices. So uh, in the next slide, uh, you see uh, a list. Uh, testing off, with guide, building block, optical IO, complex building block, etc. This is a list of, uh, elementary and not or only elementary device that should be or can be tested and uh, the characterization or testing of this uh, is useful for the designer to have a feedback on their model and their design and on the foundry to keep uh, uh, the aligned the, the, the technological process uh, uh, check the material check uh, everything uh, to comment. Uh, first of all, the, the, the pink uh, sentence uh, on the right, perfect building block do not guarantee perfect device. So even if uh, every building block is perfectly working, this does not mean that your device can be working. So, uh, first of all. Second, uh, is this uh, uh, with a level testing? Yes. In volume, well, not very sure. Behind, the, the, on the bottom, sorry, there is a testing of the device functionality. This is useful for the final user. The final user wanted to know if your, his device work or not. I would like to cite a, a sentence from a paper, by the way, by, by uh, David Miller, perfect optic with imperfect device. So that is the opposite orthogonal to the previous uh, uh, pink uh, sentence. Sometimes you have a device that works, that fulfills the requirement, even if the sum of the building block does not work as you expect. Uh, so move to the next slide. And uh, here you see a tool, uh, one of the word or the title of, the, of our JRC. So testing is not just uh, by commercial uh, instrumentation, commercial device, put them together and do the measurement. Uh, it's really conceived the, 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 the testing procedure using uh, uh, custom electronic board, uh, the software for the automation and data analysis, uh, uh, the pro bed that should be electrical and optical uh, and obviously some uh, uh, machine learning or something else that permitted to uh, do the, the smart part that I mentioned before. So instead of use, for example, 200 gigabit per second uh, for QIM polarization diversity signal, on 128 channel that means uh, a, a, a huge uh, a rec or many rec to perform something equivalent and we work on this and in the next slide you see the other world the te techniques huh, uh, that permit to do the uh, testing in this case uh, is uh, on a, a filter uh, that uh, due to the random perturbation uh, is not uh, the characteristic is not nice as you see in the middle of this uh, slide and click on the next slide you see the filter perfectly aligned and you have to 
use uh, not just a tunable laser and uh, uh, an optical spectrum analyzer, but there's much more. Huh? Uh, take into account uh, the term microstalk in the upper right of this uh, um, slide. Uh, use, for example, the signal, the modulated signal, or something similar to this instead of tunable laser. And, uh, other techniques in order to do uh, this. So this is a, uh, an example, is the, the tuning of a filter. And uh, click on the next uh, slide. And uh, this is a movie of uh, the filter that you receive from the foundry, something really uh, totally useless. And if you tune the filter, you converge to the nice shape. All this is done uh, by student huh? in less than 100 of milliseconds. So this is something that is uh, useful for wave level testing uh, of this kind of devices. Um, but, Andrea, are you are you uh, tuning all these uh, filters on the on the device simultaneously, or is it one by one? Uh, one by one. At the moment, yes, one by one, even if uh, um, the tuning is done on a output port of the filter. So uh, if you replicate uh, basically the, the electronic board that you have seen in the previous slide, uh, you can do it simultaneously. Okay, thank you. Once you uh, tune the filter, means uh, adjust the ether or the control that you have on uh, the peak. So if you go on the next slide, you see that you can repeat uh, this tuning for the various uh, central frequencies of the channel according to the ITU grid. Take note of the voltage on uh, the uh, on the ether is the table that you see behind. And this is called a lookup table. This gave a huge value of, to the chip because it's not just a, a chip that has value, but it is a chip with the rule to make it work as you would like. This is uh, the conclusion of my, of my talk. Uh, and. Uh, I'm available for questions. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Um, uh, thank you, Andrea. Thanks very much for that. I have I have a couple of questions. Um, the filter tuning you were just talking about. This is this is for my own information. I think um, maybe for the audience as well. But are we seeing applications for this filter tuning exercise outside of the telecom wavelengths? Um, with the telecom, uh, I guess you mean uh, uh, broad uh, in, in terms of optical interconnect, uh, data com, uh, telecom, uh, everything uh, uh, transmit okay. uh, signal, have to manage signal. Um, sensing, uh, optical fiber and sometimes chip are used for sensing. But uh, the signal that arrive from the optical sensor needed to be processed at the optical level. So is always uh, you have always a problem of uh, select bandwidth of uh, a wavelength or uh, select a portion of signal. So and this means filter. Um, microwave photonics, for example, is another application where filter is extremely demanding. Does that tuning? still work if the device temperature changes do uh, or are you having to take account of temperature changes um, in the device that affect the tuning it's a, it's a good a good question the testing that you have seen uh, is done uh, uh, by controlling the temperature of the chip okay. so the lookup table uh, is related to that temperature however this lookup table uh, permitted to realign all uh, the elements of the filter and have a nice response. Then if you change the temperature of the chip, it's just a rigid shift of the filter. Okay. So uh, that, that is not really a problem. The problem is put the filter together. Okay. Um, Inigo, Torsten, is there anything in particular you would like to ask of Andrea or maybe anybody from the audience? Any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize the 
importance of one of the developments that Andrea showed, which is the need for uh, wafer probing cards, which is very common to test full reticles or even full wafers in electronics. But this is something that we are lacking in photonics and hopefully will be coming soon because eventually it's something that will be needed uh, if we really want to scale up in volumes on the whole industry. So very interesting development here. So do you, you mean a probe card that can measure the, the, an entire wafer at one point in time or? No, or, or, or a reticle or a die, but fully both electrically okay. and optically, so optoelectronically at the same time. Okay. And then, but finally, it's, 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 uh, it's also the job of the, the machine builder to enable that with uh, having flexible probing uh, optically and electrically. So um, that, is, that is something what, what we are working with, uh, for example, also with, with VLC. So it's, uh, we get very valuable feedback on, uh, on that. And moving from characterization to real testing is, is, is a, an important part there. And, and I, to an extent, I guess this all falls under the, the title of designing for test. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and, and how far are how far are we with those standards? Is that some is that satisfactory at the moment, or is that something? Maybe Inigo, maybe you are the most qualified to comment on this. Yeah. Is there a long way to go? Well, there are not many standards uh, yet. Um, the same as there are not many standards for photonic packaging either. Um, some some people debate if there are there is a need for standards because <clears throat> there is not such a need as a standard package that suits all needs, right? So for testing is usually similar and depends very much of what kind of application are you testing or characterizing. It's not the same to test a transceiver than a LiDAR system or a, or a quantum device, right? So uh, it's hard to come to standards, but what I believe there is, is already some better understanding of what is needed from the layout point of view to simplify and, and ease the testing and, and some best practices that are well understood. Andrea, does that, it, how have your activities been impacted by the need for design for testing? Uh, as an impact, for sure. And it uh, was in one of my, on my slides. Uh, so we, we really started uh, thinking to add to a chip uh, uh some test pattern or test building block because uh, then you 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 test uh, i don't know a ring resonator brag uh, uh, grating coupler waveguide and that's that's all but then we realized that this is not sufficient and this does not provide an answer to the user so uh the uh, testing of uh, the uh, functionality of the device uh, is to my point of view of main importance. So um, if, I, if I go back uh, years uh, when we discussed the, the, the founders, the generic foundry in Photonic, I remember at some point uh, people uh, proposed the uh, design for manufacturing, design for assembly no, and packaging. And designer was not very happy because they said, oh, we, we, we want to do our design, no? <laughs> uh, and now there is also the design for testing. So the, the design should really take into account uh, a, a multi-physic, multidisciplinary field, testing, packaging, the functionality, the thermal behavior of the circuit, and so on. So okay. design is really <clears throat> a multi-physic, a multidisciplinary uh, field. That Indeed. cannot be. Uh, you you need expertise in PTs. Inigo. No, indeed, I fully agree with Andrea. Okay. Design needs to consider all the, uh, you know, the different stages of the product development. Okay. Okay, then um, thank you again, Andrea, for your contribution. Mm -hmm. Then thank please you, don't go. Thank please you. stick around for the for future discussion. We hope you can join in on some of the comments where we want to bring in later, during um, Inigo's uh, presentation, maybe following that. Um, again, to the audience, if anybody has any questions, you have an opportunity to pose that question in the chat and I will try and bring it into the conversation. I'm going to interrupt the flow for one moment here. We have a winner um, quite early on in Andrea's presentation. Victor Shiskin came back with uh, two correct answers that VLC was founded in 2011 and that Inigo Atondo joined in the same year. So well done. That's very correct. Um, what you couldn't know is that it was, in fact, I believe in a girl, correct me if I'm wrong, it was founded by five people, first of all. Indeed. Um, and that, that, that is not explicitly um, visible after, on, on the website. 
Um, but Victor, thank you very much. Um, make sure you drop us a line with your contact details, although if you've registered, we should have them already, and we can be in touch and organize, to organize getting that package to you. Okay, then moving on, Kevin, please. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everybody at this point um, where testing is in the product development workflow. This is, this is a slide we've seen before, and if the viewers want to look at previous webinars um, from Fagentech, they will see this slide come up in different variants in, in, in those webinars already. I don't want to labor the point and, and, and go over this again, but we see that testing is, is at least in terms of Fagentech systems, is important. It, two important stages within the product development workflow. Um, this slide is there for that, to demonstrate that aspect and um, which product lines are involved with that. And if anybody has any questions, please you can get back in touch with us at this point in time and, and we can give you some more information about what specific systems are involved there. The other thing I wanted to highlight at this point is Kevin, thank you, is, is how fast these markets are growing. So we have, if you look at the whole of photonics as a whole, so macro photonics, um, it's been growing at and is forecast to continue to grow at somewhere like seven or eight percent CAGR until 2025 or even 2032. If you have a look at the markets or the most important markets relevant to integrated photonic technologies or dependent upon integrated photonic technologies, we see that these markets are growing across all regions. And in fact, these are two reports. One of them is from Yol, I believe. I need to put in the reference there, but um, anywhere between 25 to 40 percent. So we're expecting to see significant growth in these areas, and it's very important that we collaborate within the ecosystem together to get some standards and to get, get a baseline and get some base technologies and platforms um, operational so that we can um, cater to the assembly and testing needs, um, not only within Europe, but also, also globally. Um, if Nobody else has any further comments at this point. Then I would very much like to move on to your contribution, Inigo. Kevin, if you can move over. And um, Inigo, please, I, you know the your stuff better than I do. The stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Kevin. So I'll be quickly introducing, uh, you know, the challenges and, and solutions that we see coming in, in peak testing, photon integrated circuit testing. So Kevin, please, let's let's move on. Uh, yeah, the main points of my talk are exactly these. First of all, discuss a little bit of the testing needs and challenges nowadays that we see from our many different customers and projects, and what are the solutions that wafer level testing enables, and a few takeaways. So let's go to the next slide. Next one. The next one. Yeah. So very, very briefly, um, just an introduction for those of you who don't know VLC Photonics. So we are a design and test house uh, based in Valencia, in Spain. Uh, last year, actually, we were acquired by Hitachi Hitech. So we are now part of the Hitachi group. And what we provide is all kinds of services for developing uh, photonic integrated circuits. So starting from, from the very uh, basic consultancy to define optical architecture, then the, the, the core activity of VLC Photonics, which is the design uh, and layout of uh, the different components and circuits uh, of the photonic circuit. Then we are a fabless company, so we outsource the manufacturing to more than 20 different foundries in all the main material platforms. We work with silicon photonics, indium phosphide, silicon nitride, PLC, and, and other exotic platforms. And then what is, I think, of most importance today, we have been also for 10 years working on the chip and now wafer level testing and characterization of photonic circuits while leaving the assembly and test for different packaging partners we have also worked uh, with over the years. So let's focus first then on the, on the chip testing and wafer level testing. Kevin, please. Um, th there is something that is very clearly acknowledged nowadays is that photonic circuits, even if they have matured very much over the years, these last years, they are still not as mature as electronic circuits. We are like 30, 40 years running behind. And this means that foundry PDKs uh, are not as developed. Uh, we don't have, in many cases, uh, enough information on the PDKs or tolerances or things like that. Component libraries are not that extent. And in, in general, the yields of the fabs is not that high if you compare it. So because of all these, this is still very critical to do very extensive component and circuit level characterization when we develop a product. And this means that we have many things that involved uh, this, this characterization and testing. 
First of all, the optical probing, optical alignment, which is much more difficult than in electronics, is 10 to 100 times more difficult due to the very strict tolerances. Uh, of course, we have to do not only electrical measurements, but also optical and auto-electronic measurements. And then uh, all the processing of this data and eventually finding what goes wrong, the root cause analysis is also quite complex. And of course, uh, that is on the engineering side, let's say prototyping, characterization for that. But when you move into production, into higher volumes, scalability becomes an issue. You still require uh, functional circuit testing, even if foundries do the, the, the metrology on the PCM cells. Uh, it needs to be done very fast and very low cost if you want to achieve um, high volumes and you need to be able to short wafers or non-good dyes. And yeah, in general, parallelization is hard. So if you go to the next slide, uh, why it's hard in general testing? Uh, well, first of all, you, you require a certain infrastructure, which means investment in clean rooms, probing stations, instrumentation, which can be very, very expensive, uh, stocking of consumables, and eventually also redundancy of all these things. Because if you are embedded into a testing campaign, into a very tight uh, timeline for product development, you cannot afford an instrument or a probing station that is down for, for some time. Of course, then you also need the engineering expertise. So you need people that are expert in automation, in photonics, engineers on data processing and analysis, and of course, be able to have everything calibrated and with certain quality process in place. And, and finally, of course, timing, which is of an essence in terms of procurement of all these, these uh, infrastructure, equipment, components, etc hiring of the, your engineering team. And of course, once you have everything, being able to install and configure that uh, for production in, in short time. So that, that puts a lot of pressure on the timing. So if you go to the next slide, Kevin, please. Um, that's where wafer level testing comes into play. I think it's solving many of, of these issues. If you go to the next slide, what is used for automated wafer level testing is to, it's a now enabling the auto automated identification of non-tested dyes and non-good dyes. And this enables you to short good dyes and wafers. And of course, as designers as we are, it helps you to feedback all the design models uh, with all the test information. So you are able to uh, iterate on the, on the building block design, on the circuit design, with a lot of data that enables statistical parametrization. And of course, this also helps to, as Andrea said in the past, um, to provide feedback to the foundries uh, to increase the FAB yield, and this eventually helps to accelerate the development and, and the volume ramp up. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you uh, what we have been working with uh, with Ficontech on the last years. Uh, this is a machine that is now in our clean room uh, provided by Ficontech. It's a full production enclosure wafer level tester. I will not spend much time on this because it has been presented in other uh, events, but it's basically a, a tool that has image recognition capabilities with different probes for fiber alignment and um, electrical probing as well. Fiber including only individual fibers, but fiber arrays. There was a lot of um, uh, technology and also know-how built up over the last, uh, uh, over the last year. And um, I can offer this, uh, and uh, Inigo uh, specifically uh, wants to do that, to offer this knowledge um, uh, to other companies, because it doesn't make sense if everybody uh, reinvents the wheel here. So there are, Prover companies um, uh, in the market, which are mainly coming from the electronic test side, they're very, very capable. Um, but testing optical devices requires um, uh, some different know-how than than uh, what uh, what is usually known in the uh, in the electronic probing. And this knowledge, and this is why we have this uh, set up this um, this web uh, uh, web meeting like this. Um, you need instrumentation, you need to know how uh, the know-how, how to test the wafer, and you need the machine itself. And that there was a lot of things built up over the last year, which we would like to offer to other people. And, and uh, specifically, DLC can help to speed up the either service, um, uh, test as a service, uh, or helping other customers uh, to to um, speed up um, working with our machine. So is that it's, it's, an, it's an offer to the market. Um, and I think it's it's very valuable. Can can I ask Inigo? Did you know what you were looking for when you went to the market looking for a system? 
Well, yes and no. We have some clear ideas of what we needed because as a design house, we need to be very flexible. We work with many different technologies, different platforms. So on the one side, we what we needed is a lot of flexibility on the tool. But on the other side, um, it's critical that uh, a wafer level tester is stable uh, and it's fast enough. And it has also a very user-friendly graphical user interface and programming way, because this is essential for operators, which don't need to be like PhD level, right? So it was a process of discovery together with Ficon Tech on, on the, 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 the final configuration of this tool and, and you know, these accessories, yes. And, and, and previously, this has all been done manually. Yeah, up to now, we had some semi-automated uh, testing setups, uh, which allowed for basic uh, dye level characterization and even electrical wafer level testing, but not fully automated optoelectronic wafer level testing. Okay, good. And, and specifically, uh, the, the keyword there is uh, uh, multi-project uh, um, wafers because the, the, um, the functions are all different, the pattern might be different, and um, that's what we accomplished to automate fairly well, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Keep in mind that we work with small wafers and, and big wafers from two, three inch wafers of sodium phosphide up to eight or 12 inches of silicon photonics. So we need a chuck that is flexible enough on that. And then the configuration of the probe arms needs to be flexible, uh, north, west, east, south, uh, to, to accommodate all the different testing schemes. So you will see that in, in the next slide. So there you see that the, the, the chuck is very flexible. It's also thermally controlled. Uh, we have full flexibility on the probe inside. So the five contact tool is, is enabling that. And also the, uh, the cameras is allowing, are allowing for uh, all kinds of image uh, recognition on the patterns, uh, on the fiducials of, of the, 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 the chips and the wafers. Um, yeah, so if you go to the next slide, uh, we have been testing that on vertical grating couplers, which is the most usual configuration for wafer level testing. Uh, and we have achieved very good repeatability here in the order of 0.1 dB uh, in silicon photonics, 0.4 dB in other technologies, and less than four seconds optical fiber alignment. But one thing that is, I believe two things that are worth mentioning here is that, first of all, the tool is also capable of doing edge level wafer level testing. So if you are able to dig a trench in the wafer and embed some, we'll discuss this later, we are able to do edge coupling. But also, as you can see in the lower uh, left corner, we are able to do die level testing as well. As long as the dies are properly placed in a, in a platform, uh, the tool is also able to work at that at die level, which is proving very handy in, in some cases when you have pieces of wafers or individual dies, but you have many of them. And also, as Torsten said, uh, it's not that we only offer the services of testing, uh, you know, uh, photonic integrated circuits, chips, or wafers to customers, but we also, first of all, partner with FiContech to extend that same setup or configuration of the, the whole uh, wafer level testing tool uh, for customers. Uh, so we can place, we can support on the photonic engineering side uh, to be able to scale that up at the customer facilities or through an OSAT. And then also to be able to help other customers to develop their own processes on, on the five contact tools. So we are very, very tightly collaborating on that. You know, Torsten, we have a, we have a question in the chat that is, um, that is it's best to bring it in at this point, I think, in the in the presentation. We have a we have a question from Maureen. Can the equipment be used for MEMS and MOEMS testing? That's the first question. And I think the second question is maybe a bit more difficult. Can it be operated under vacuum during testing? Yeah, okay. So um, first question, yes. Actually, the tool is agnostic of what you actually test. So we have been uh, doing some projects where we are able to test uh, anything that can be vertically probed, like for example, photodetectors or pixels, and MEMS testing, as long as you are able to do, I don't know, electrical probing of the MEMS, why not? Of course, you will be able to do so. Uh, vacuum, no, it's not something that we are implementing now. Uh, so the, the chips are tested in a room temperature and in an uh, open atmosphere, so it's not under vac vacuum. No. Okay. Not sure if it could be implemented. Maybe this is a question for Torsten. Uh, I got the the, the question. The, so for um, uh, we're we're working on uh, solutions for very um, uh, high and low temperatures, um, but but vacuum we have not uh, we have not considered yet. 
uh, would be also difficult to get the uh, the motion control into the um, uh, into the system uh, because actually the the active alignment uh, units that come from top. So. Yeah. And we, we have another question. Let's let's continue with that because I think it's this is the right time to bring it in from um, Jasper Jans. Um, would this setup also support fiber array alignment? I I I, yeah. I think Jasper. Then you definitely need to tune into the webinar next week. Um, but um, but Inigo or Torsten, perhaps better if you have a quick response to that question. Would it also support fiber array alignment? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the tool is aligning is aligning individual fibers or fiber arrays. Yeah, both right. both are super and, and and both uh, vertically and uh, horizontal um, uh, capabilities. So the these uh, periscope approach in the in the trenches also work uh, with with fiber arrays. And and I think Jasper, if you have a look at our website, there is a promo video um, on the the VLT system um, where we actually specifically state that. Um, it can do fiber array alignment above um, outputs, input output ports above a wafer. Hope that answers your question. Okay, if there are yeah. no other questions or comments, then move on. Okay, so the next slide uh, explains a little bit more of this uh, edge coupling capability. So the tool has been successfully demonstrated to do um, edge coupling in uh, trenches of wafers, right? So if you are able to dig a trench enough to embed some kind of uh, 3D printed periscope, into these trends, you are able to actually uh, perform edge coupling uh, or bat coupling into waveguides, as you can see on the diagram on the right. And by doing this, enabling edge uh, level wafer level testing. So in some technologies, this is important. For example, in silicon nitride, where most of the coupling is done on the edge side, or even in silicon photonics, where using of vertical grating couplers uh, may be very convenient, but on the other side, they are limited in bandwidth. So if you want to, uh, exploit all the, the full bandwidth uh, and also maybe achieve lower losses to standard single mode fiber, uh, edge coupling is, is really needed. Um, so in the next slide, you see, for example, uh, some, some wafers with these trenches here. There are different trench configuration. You can see one of them here. And then the very small 3D printed periscope, uh, which has the advantage also that can be uh, defined or custom designed to adapt to different mole field diameters depending on the waveguides that you are coupling to and the material platform. So that's very convenient. Uh, you know, go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to emphasize just uh, to end up my presentation, uh, how key are speed and repeatability when you are doing wave level testing. So just to show you some examples, right, of different projects. Uh, in the case of uh, first project, it was six, 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 six inch wafers with more than 300 dies. Uh, in, in every die, there were many structures. So in total, it was more than 5,000 structures. And for every structure, sometimes you need to do more than one measurement. So in total, it was in the order of 50,000 measurements if, if you would be to measure the whole, the whole set of uh, structures and wafers. Um, on the other one, it was a silicon photonics project, two 8-inch wafers, more than 1,800 1, dies more than almost 15,000 structures and in the order of 50, 60 K measurements. And in the last project, for example, it was only individual dies, not wafers, but there were many of them and with many structures and many measurements in all these structures. So what I'm telling to tell here is that uh, being able to probe both electrically and optically in a very fast way and accelerate the trace acquisition time is really essential if you really want to scale up. And of course, uh, as you can see, the amount of measurements can scale up very quickly. So if you are scaling up also in the number of dyes or wafers, it's essential to build a smart, a smart characterization plan because otherwise it can become impractical. Another very important point is repeatability. Um, coming from photonic integration, most of the times people are used to dye level testing and this is done most of the times manually. And the alignment here is quite poor. So the repeatability is in the order of 0.5 to 1 dB. Um, if you are using automated wave level testing, you ensure that all the alignment and trace acquisition are done fully automatically. There is no variation by you know, temperature, by mechanical stability and things like that. So you can see here a map of repeatability over 10 measurements of the insertion loss in a wafer. And you see that in average, we are in around 0.1 dB repeatability, um, which is, I would say, pretty good. Um, there is still margin for improvement here. 
Uh, in the next slide, you see a little bit more information on here because uh, it's important to differentiate between characterization and testing. Characterization is done when you are doing prototyping and engineering, and your objective is to be able to test every device up to the limits. While when you are doing testing, it's all about sorting what are the good dice versus the bad dice according to some pre-established criteria. Okay, so when you are doing engineering, you can you find all kinds of funny stuff when receiving wafers, especially when foundries are doing process development or you are testing new building blocks um, that uh, reach the limit. And here you can see, for example, in the top, a pretty decent wafer where there is not much variability uh, between the different reticles. And you see that the deviation in the different measurements, for example, in this case, we are talking about insertion losses, is pretty similar for all the reticles uh, also in Waveland. But you see also different variations when things go wrong, right? And this is the kind of things that you are only able to detect when you do wafer level testing. Because if you only get one reticle, you are not really seeing the whole picture. And for example, in the lower left corner, you see a very difficult case when some of the reticles are, are performing bad, some others are good. And it's, it's very hard to do the root cause analysis here on what's going wrong. While on the right side, you have a wafer map that is clearly showing that half of the wafer is, is, is not being processed uh, properly, right? So uh, once you have all the wafer level testing information, doing the root cause analysis and understanding what went wrong in order to improve <laughs> the FAB process and the designs is also one of the most important things. And this is all about photonic integration expertise. Inigo, um, so uh, I guess the important takeaway from these last two slides is, is one, that the automated wave level test is enabling let's call it big data, big statistical data on the quality of the of the of the devices on the on the, across the across the entire wafer, which was previously from a resource point of view, just not feasible. Exactly, exactly. And it gives a, a whole new insight of of the, the performance of the chips, the circuits and the yield of the FAB process, which is very important for foundries, for example, when they are developing their PDKs. But it's also very important for customers when they are building their own component libraries and circuits for production. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Please continue. So that, that's mainly the whole thing I wanted to introduce. I will just leave you with some takeaways in the next slide. Uh, yeah, the next one, please. Which is that indeed, wafer level testing is really a must when you, when you move into product development. And it's also important to do a characterization when you are doing doing prototyping and engineering and really high volume testing when you are moving into pilot production and volume ramp up. So we have been working with many customers over the years on these. We have a lot of experience in different material platforms and a fully ready lab and engineering team. And one of the important things I wanted to emphasize is that beyond also the redundancy that we have built in over the years, uh, all our processes are ISO 9001 quality certified and and yeah, we have all our setups calibrated. So I think this is also important when you really get into serious uh, product development. So that's all. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss uh, openly. Um, I have a few. I don't want to. Um... OK, so we have a we, good, very done. Well done, Victor. We have a question from Victor Sushkin, uh, the guy who won the, uh, the, the, uh, the giveaway today. What was, and actually this couples in well to a question I have. What was the trigger for Hitachi to acquire VLC? And, and, and if I can add to that question, um, um, what has changed then for VLC through the um, interaction with Hitachi? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So Hitachi uh, or Hitachi High Tech, I would say better, uh, they have been a leader in uh, supporting uh, telecom and datacom uh, companies, uh, developing components and modules and systems over the years. Uh, by providing all the support on the, uh, on the microassembly of components and uh, procurement and acquisition of different parts, and in general, all the logistics to scale that production up. However, uh, photonic integration has been a key enabling technology for telecom and datacom uh, products in the last years, and Hitachi High Tech was missing this, this kind of uh, engineering side of things. That's why, what, that was the main reason why uh, VLC Photonics was acquired. And it was actually pretty complementary because we come to um, extend the service offering for for yeah for all this this development based on optics and photonics. Uh, that was mainly the trigger, also based on our experience over the years, our well-known brand and expertise on all the different material platforms and, and application markets. 
what has changed? Well, uh, we have been growing over the last 10 years, but of course now being part of Hitachi is, is a large corporation. Many things have changed. Uh, as you can imagine, there is a lot more bureaucracy, which is not nice. But uh, of course, that's something that you have to live in when you are incorporated into large companies. And this also gives you, uh, Hitachi High Tech has been giving us a lot of visibility all over the world, uh, has been growing our sales network, of course, supporting our customers to grow in terms of, of uh, facing larger developments and scaling up into production, uh, especially with all the partners that they have in AC as well. So uh, it's giving us mainly the robustness uh, in terms of financials and legal and logistics to really face uh, large product developments and projects. But there, Victor has another question. Sorry, I had to retune. Victor had another question and that was um, coming back. I think it was mentioned on one of your slides, Inigo. Um, he, Victor is asking, how long is the fiber array active alignment? And I think it's a few seconds, is that right? Less than four seconds, but it, it depends very much also on the coupling structure that we are using. The type of vertical grating coupler or the type of edge coupler and uh, how it's designed and what material platform what right. type of fiber. Also, we work with specialty fibers. So it's hard to give a number here, but from what we have seen, standard vertical grating couplers, single mold fiber below four seconds for sure. Okay, and do we see any different times for the um, for the 3D printed periscopes? Or is it similar? No, not really, pretty similar. But there, there's a mainly the, uh, the, the preparation of that. Uh, so the, the vision alignment before you move into the trench, uh, the alignment itself is, is easy. It, it, was, it doesn't change the, the time. Okay, but the trenches need to, need to accommodate the periscopes, of course, and we're back sure. to the topic yeah. of, yeah. of uh, yeah. design for testing in that case, aren't we? Yeah, what is important is also that people wanting to use this kind of edge coupling approach takes into consideration when they are doing the design to include these trenches. And if somebody is interested, we can give more details on the design needs for these trenches. And Victor's on a roll today. We have another question. What about LIDARs and sensors? Is Hitachi developing this with VLC too? Yeah, so keep in mind that Hitachi is offering services to develop all kinds of products based on optics and photonics. And they are mainly focused on optical communications because traditionally that has been the biggest market in telecom and datacom. But of course, you know, there are many other markets opening up uh, like LiDAR, like sensing, like quantum, where of course VLC and Hitachi will offer, be offering services here, yes. Okay. I have one, one topic, and actually Andrea, this is something you mentioned in our rehearsal, Yes, everybody, we rehearse um, yesterday. Um, and, and that is maybe that we should start a conversation about RF. Um, we've been talking about optoelectronic um, um, testing of PICs, um, and that is what the system can do. But of course, it's, it's actually three regimes of signal that need to be tested, that need to be acquired. There's, there's the DC or the quasi DC electrical signals. There's the opto aspect, opt optical um, um, channel aspect. But there's also the RF component, which we haven't touched on uh, touched on at all today. Um, my question, I guess, to the to the panel is: um, Do you see that as being important? Do we know what the status is or what the what the requirement is for RF um, within a system like this at this point in time? So, if I start, so we get the request for for RF testing um, uh, all the time. Um, I personally don't know if it's only for the characterization or if it's also for the uh, uh, for the large uh, volume um, testing. So at the moment, most of the systems uh, we are we are deploying, um, it's it's for um, it's for characterization. And for sure, the more flexibility you have, the better. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, um, uh, Inigo. Maybe you can uh, you can tell from your side. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree, Torsten. Um, for characterization, there is really a need, and we are also being requested that, and we are actually offering services on that respect. We are able to reach up to 50 gigahertz uh, RF testing here at VLC Photonics, and actually we, we would have access to be able to reach up to 110. But uh, the, the floor is open for debate if, it, if RF is needed uh, when you move into high volume testing, or if some more basic measurements, uh, maybe only on, at the DC side and optical side, are unable to qualify the chips or the wafers and then move them to assembly where more thorough uh, RF testing is done, especially as because Andrea said, 
um, the, the, the packaging in itself may modify the RF um, response. You agree, Andrea, by the looks of things? Uh, yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, it, it is obvious that uh, the final user or, or, and the designer think about uh, to the performance uh, at the RF level. If you, if you design a modulator, uh, you want to see the modulator working at uh, correctly at the, the, the frequency you you, you plan uh, but but the, the the wire bonding the connector the cable or the the, the electro that bring the signal to the um, to the device uh, the, the driver itself the, and the combination driver and load uh, is uh, cannot be thought in it separately so you have to see them together uh, but I go back to the what I said that during my presentation you now find uh, something equivalent uh, so maybe measure something else uh, at lower frequency uh, that permit uh, to extract the information uh, uh, for the working at high frequencies okay so this can be the the way to avoid uh, uh, direct uh, RF testing uh, on wafer. Good, thank you. Um, I personally have no other questions. I, one thing I do need to take into account, Torsten, I believe you need to go. I actually need to go as well. <laughs> ah, okay, then we have a couple of slides to round off, um, but I guess what we'll do is we'll just um, kill it here. Um, um, and if people want to view the rest of the slides there, just about how you can get in touch with Fikentech and where you can find other materials on the website, then watch the webinar per view on demand. It will go up online over the next couple of days. It will be non-gated um, so that we can share this material with Andrea and with, uh, with Inigo and they can post it themselves. Thank you, everybody, for taking part today. Thank you so much. Torsten, Andrea, Inigo, thank you very much for the discussion. And to the viewers for your contributions and to the questions. Um, that was a very interesting topic today, and I hope that was useful for everybody who was involved. Thank you indeed. Uh, thank thanks you. a lot. Thank I just dropped my email on the everyone. chat in case somebody has more questions. Uh, thanks okay. a lot. Yes. Thank great. you. Bye-bye. 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 No bye -bye. bye -bye. If you want to find out more about Fighting Tech, um, you can go to our webinar page, follow the QR code. Um, we have recently you're registered anyway, so you have access anyway, but maybe you can pass on the information to others. Um, all of the previous webinars on our website are now freely available. You can, of course, also go to our homepage. And of course, at any time, feel free to get in directly in contact with Fikentech, um, either locally within Germany, within Europe, or at any of our other locations. Kevin, next slide, please. Around the globe in the US. Um, in Estonia, in Ireland, in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Thailand. Um, we will have some news in the short term regarding our activities in the USA, um, and there will be more demonstration of what that means um, when we attend the Photonics West event in 2022 at the end of January. Again, okay, last slide. Thank you, everyone, to everyone involved. Kevin, thank you for holding, taking care of the technical side. I hope that was useful to everybody. Again, to our viewers, thank you everybody for watching and to our guest speakers, thank you indeed. Goodbye. Photonics Automated Assembly and Testing from Lab to Fab